So welcome, welcome to the uh, 2018 Quarter 4 Pro Dev or Professional Development uh, class. This is a series that we do quarterly where the educators from counterculture like to take an idea or a concept that they want to learn more about um, and kind of dig pretty deep into it. And then we have a class and we can kind of um, talk about something in a slightly more nerdy or geeky way. And we can kind of have this idea of peer-to-peer -peer education uh, where these are things that we are learning more about as an industry. And these are things that we can kind of all touch on together. So uh, we are talking about Green Coffee Fade for uh, our quarter four pro dev. Thank you so much for being here. So Counterculture is a company that buys green coffee and then uh, transports that coffee across the oceans, holds that coffee as green coffee in our warehouses, uh, roasts that coffee, and then uh, sends it to uh, cafes and coffee shops such as yours, right? And I feel like I spend a lot of time talking with you and with other accounts about things like freshness, right? Like age of roasted coffee since it's been roasted, right? You know, carbon dioxide levels, those kinds of things. But on the back side, on the green purchasing side, and also on like the storage and warehousing side and the roasting side, we talk about green coffee fade, the way that green coffee changes, because it's not inert. It doesn't stay exactly as it is, right? So for a definition that we will use for fade today, the degradation of green coffee resulting in specific off flavors that get stronger over time. So this is kind of the loss of unique characteristics that we have from unique coffees. Now, if I were to kind of like ask you all, what are your favorite coffee origins? Like, where do you really love, like what flavors, like where do you really love those coffees from? Ethiopia. Ethiopia, right? Wash Ethiopians, like uh, sun-dried? Yeah, like jammy, those like strawberry flavors, right? So you have all those amazing flavors in those coffees, but once you, that coffee starts to fade, you're gonna be changing and exchanging those strawberries for the flavor of the box that the coffee was shipped in instead. Mm -hmm. What else? What other coffees do we love? Shout out your origin. Kenya, Kenya right? It's like the, like the blackberry and the like hibiscus and like the savory kind of flavors, like lime and like real like intense, right? So once that coffee starts to fade though, we're gonna exchange those flavors for the flavor of the bag the coffee gets shipped in. What else? What other coffees do we love? Guatemala. Guatemala, right? Is it like the nutty and kind of like sweet and kind of apple-y and chocolatey flavors, right? Too bad, once that coffee gets faded, it's gonna taste just like the coffee from Kenya or from Ethiopia as well, right? So that's a problem. We have all these unique flavors and we don't wanna be exchanging those flavors for things that are really homogenous kind of across the board, right? So green coffee fade, right? Fading in the distance, what causes it? What's happening here? What can we do to kind of prevent or offset or delay this fading process of happening, right? And what do you do once the coffee's actually kind of faded, right? What's it look like? What's it taste like? One thing we know for certain is that it's not very straightforward. It's not entirely understood, right? The Specialty Coffee Association defines fade as past crop flavors and while age of coffee since it's been harvested is definitely part of this, it's not all of it. It's not the major part necessarily. It's definitely a contributing factor, but it's not the only thing, right? And so it's kind of one of these ideas where there's not even a consensus on what we do with faded coffee across the industry. If you look at um, the Specialty Coffee Association cupping form, this is the long form version up here, there's no part on there for fade. That's not an element, right? This is an example of what we have internally for our own cupping forms that we use. Similarly, there isn't really a part for fade on there. Internally at Counterculture, I feel like this is something we spend a lot of attention on. We pay a lot of attention to because we buy green coffee and then we roast coffee as well. And so we get to see coffee as it goes through that kind of arc. And so we talk about fade on a scale of like one to 10. One being like the very first instance of kind of like a fade flavor or signs of fade. 10 being like, oh my gosh, this coffee tastes like fade and basically like nothing else, right? And so this is something where you can kind of like track coffee as it's changing, as it goes through its life cycle, right? So we definitely think that age of coffee since it's been harvested is important. We're gonna do some taste tests with that later, but things like moisture content, how the coffee's been packaged and stored, how the coffee got to that, kind of like moisture content as well. Excuse me, there's a lot of other things that can contribute to this as well. So it's a little bit of a complex kind of situation. And we don't really have hard facts on this is the chemical that is the difference between your delicious sun-dried Ethiopian coffee when it's fresh and then your sun-dried Ethiopian coffee in 18 months or after it tastes like cardboard box. Um, Kyle Tush, who is one of our quality analysts down in Durham where we have our headquarters and also uh, is on our green buying team, he's working with researchers at North Carolina State University to kind of figure this out, to kind of research this like chemically what's happening when coffee starts to show signs of fade. 
but we don't have concrete evidence on that yet. We don't have results yet. So a lot of what we talk about today is going to be anecdotal instead. These are our experiences. This is what we've observed. These are the conclusions we've kind of come to as well. So take that with a grain of salt, and I'm really interested to kind of see like what other conclusions you might think or what your experiences have been as well. We can kind of share stories as well, this way to some extent. How's that sound? So how do we even kind of identify what's happening with green coffee and fade, right? This is one of these things where like, can you look at a coffee and be like, oh, that coffee is going to be faded? Not really, at least not under normal spectrum light. When you look at coffee with your own eyes, it'll look just like green coffee. It's not going to look any different regardless of whether or not it's faded. What we have up here, though, is coffee that's under UV light. And we can tell some differences between coffee once we put it under that spectrum. On the left side over here, we have coffee that is showing what we'll call modeling. Now, oftentimes, best case scenario for coffee is to just be like homogenous kind of in color, no instances of kind of uh, um, showing under UV light. And if you look on here, we see a lot of seeds that have like different colorations, lighter spots and darker spots. So the seed itself is not one homogenous color. That's something we'll call modeling. If you look on the little slide on the right, you can see these coffee seeds all look basically the same. They all look uniform in color. These two or three little exceptions are actually pulper damage. So when the coffee goes through the machine that takes the skin off the outside of the fruit, it just gets dinged right there and gets like a little dent kind of taken out of it. So those like bright spots or hot spots right there are pulper damage. But over here, we see this variation kind of in color. It's kind of purple, it's kind of white, right? So this can clue us in that there may be something wrong with the coffee. Now, the way this works is that we will receive a pre-shipment of the coffee. So a small amount is kind of a sample. We'll visually look at it with like a little handheld UV light. Um, and then we can roast the coffee and we can taste it. And we use that as a basis for whether or not we want to purchase a full amount of that coffee or a full lot, right? Once the full lot shows up, we can kind of check that against the sample that we had to make sure that nothing happened to that coffee while it was in transit, because this can take weeks and months sometimes, right? And so after those things, we'll continue to kind of check the coffee under UV light and also through like cuppings and tastings throughout the life of all the coffees on the menu, right? So there's a lot of analysis that goes into kind of looking at coffee and whether or not it's changing. And when we see modeling happen, that's usually not a good sign, right? But it's one of these things where a coffee that shows modeling won't necessarily taste faded, but a coffee that tastes faded will generally always show modeling, right? It's kind of in one direction, yes, the other direction, not necessarily. Um, example of this, uh, Las Murgas from 2017. Did anybody have that coffee? Yeah, right? It was on the Cherry Street menu too, right? It was so good. It was such a tasty coffee. Pre-shipment of that coffee came in, looked great. When the full lot of that coffee came in though, like it totally looked modeled. Like it totally had like some like things that would show under UV light that would be signs of something isn't necessarily right here. But when we roasted the coffee, it was delicious. It was on our menu. It sold out before like we were done drinking it. And so it was a really good example of a coffee that like was stellar, that didn't necessarily look right. And so there can be a couple different things that can cause this. So it's an indication that something might not be going according to plan, but it isn't necessarily a sign that the coffee's not going to taste good. How's that sound? Sweet. So visually, that can be one part of it. The biggest way we really look for signs of fade is in tasting it. So we go through cuppings all the time. We're continually tasting the coffees that are on our menu to see how they're kind of aging. And what we're looking for when we cup coffees are either tastes or aromas that have been described as things like woody, cardboardy, pulpy, but not like coffee pulp, kind of like wood pulp, sawdust, astringent, right? Lot, I know, right, a lot of delicious flavors. Mm, it's gonna get ready for this, right? Depending on where the coffee comes from, may some people have said that fade kind of shows like um, fermented pineapple kind of flavors. So you can see these are flavors that you don't necessarily want to be having in your coffee. Um, and there's also, I think, room for different people to kind of describe these coffees kind of differently. So what we're gonna do is actually jump into our first tasting. So we have five coffees that all should be showing strong signs of fade. These are all coffees that have been sitting at room temperature in our roastery in Durham uh, since August in burlap or jute bags. So these are all coffees that are kind of meant to be showing signs of fade. Um, and the idea here is that all these coffees have been treated kind of appropriately. So the five coffees that we have are Pemba Burundi, Kabewa Natural, which is a uh, yeah, uh, natural processed coffee uh, from Uganda. We've got uh, Finca Belgravia, Tabi variety, which is a coffee from Colombia, and last but not least, Finca El Puente Honey Process Geisha. That's a lot of words right there, and that's coffee from uh, Honduras that we love and have worked with for a number of years. 
But beyond, but like before and after, to go to the doctor after you guys have a thing. Yeah. yeah. But also, just leave the cider on your on your radiator. Oh, okay. Cool. All right. So, uh, cup and table is officially open. Feel free to kind of uh, uh, smell the coffee, uh, taste the taste the cups. We're gonna do the one and done method. Um, so we've got one spoon, and we'll keep washing the spoons. I'm gonna pull this just to get the cups. So you don't have to necessarily go in this order, but. That's kind of what they are. One, two, three, four, five. I'll take the 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 one, two, three, four, five. Coffee number one, Pemba. So it's like kind of vegetal, like old and funky kind of thing. I wrote Old Tree House in this kind of city of like, like outside wood, like musty kind of old wood. Old wood and musk was kind of that idea of for me. So I feel like musty and musty is kind of like a thing we've got in the coffee a little bit. And our overall average, oh, where's my book? Can you pass me a book behind me? Thank you so much. Okay. So, we had Kyle Tush, who is uh, one of our quality analysts and green coffee buyers, go through and cup all of these coffees as well and give his opinion on what the fade level of all of these was. So, for number one, Pemba, number zero means no fade whatsoever, 10 is OMG Totes Faded. He said this coffee was a seven. Pretty high level of fade. That would not be on our menu under any stretch of the imagination. Uh, so, yeah, cool. Who's, who wrote nine? Lots of fade flavors, right? So this is a pretty good example of fade, I think. Kabewa, overripe plum, carpet samples, agave, slightly musty, grape drink, and some other stuff as well. So <laughs> this one had more like fruity flavors still, right? Like it still tasted like kabewa natural to some extent, but it definitely had this like, yeah, I think musty is kind of a pretty good way to put this one. Um, two, six, five, four, ooh, we got a winner. You put this one as a five right there, so. Um, that was kind of how this one ranked. Yeah, not quite as faded, but still like not something we want really on our menu. Also, the topic is a coffee from Mexico that we love. Green beans, cardboard, wood chips, netting, woody, dirty mushrooms, wet mushrooms, smiley face. <laughs> um, this coffee is an interesting one because this had a lot of weird flavors, right? Now, some of these coffees are like last year's crops as well. This one is, was actually harvested in March. So this coffee got a two from it. Whoa. Right? And now the reason he gave that coffee a two was because he was differentiating this like kind of like nutty flavor from fade flavor. So this is an instance of a coffee that had like a kind of interesting flavor that, you know, I'm not exactly sure it was from, but it tasted more like Quakers kind of. If you're that like popcorn-y kind of more like nutty flavor from Quakers, it kind of reminded me of that a little bit. Mm -hmm. so you're saying this is kind of just like a coffee that has a bit more like a nutty flavor to it. So that's what that flavor was that kind of stood out to me. Um, this is a coffee that is in the, in the relatively same area as Sierra Mixteca, which is another coffee that's been our menu. Have you had that coffee, Sierra Mixteca, or Sierra Mixtape, as we call it? Mm -hmm. um, and so, this is one of these coffees where I think it kind of had a bit of a different kind of flavor. We marked it pretty a fair amount higher, um, even though it didn't get as high of a fade rating. Finca del Gravia Tabi variety, grapefruit skin, garden, <laughs> garden has, I love that. Grape muster old barrels, like the. Stuff that's left over after you make wine. That was kind of my thought, right? <laughs> lemon tip, check mark, hollow. Lemon from the bottom of old, cold, hot tea. Oh, okay. Yeah. When like all the good stuff has been taken out of it, and it's like just a piss. That's so fun. Look at that. Um, yeah, this coffee had a lot of. How many ways can we say? Right. You gave this one a five. Right there. So right, kind of in the middle. Last but not least, pink. Oh my gosh, I've got this weird flavor on my last time. Pink al puente, um, honey processed and geisha. Uh, this is a coffee that we will taste it again. Same thing with Finca Bulgravia. Overripe peaches, uh, rainwashed blackberry <laughs> branches. I feel like rainwashed blackberry branches and old treehouse are kind of like, <laughs> real similar. That's like yeah. the same Venn diagram. It's just a circle, right? Yeah. <laughs> Muted and invisible. Interesting. Yeah, a lot of things that you think should be there with like fun processing and really excellent uh, variety are not. And so you're right on the money with this one. This coffee was. That's right there. So you really nailed it. Um, and so, yeah, interesting kind of spread. Anybody surprised by any of this stuff? I if I had given it a number, I would have been a right in the middle. Uh, no, eight. I would have given it more like a three. I thought it was delicious. Interesting. All right. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Good. Good. But like overall, kind of takeaways. Like if I were to say, hey, what does fade taste like? 
what commonalities do these coffees have? What words would you use? Dull. 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 Sure. Yeah. Muted. Yeah. Muted. Yeah. Muted. Sure. I feel like we see a lot of this like musty, like overripe. Yeah, musty, slightly fermenty thing. Mm -hmm. But then also we have this like idea of like wet wood that seems to kind of still be popping up. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Uh, where they put carpet samples, like if you ever like get your face like into your Berber carpet and kind of smell like that, and you're like, that's what I'm uh, carpet samples, right? You're like a kid and you're in like elementary school and you have like, make sure you like exercise your sit, exercise your sit muscles. Mm -hmm. Let's exercise our quiet muscles. You sit in the carpet square. That's what makes me think of. It. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I can see that. All right. Um, we're gonna any any other kind of like takeaways from this? Awesome. The next one is going to be both these two coffees, four different ways. Let's take a few minutes and we're going to kind of tidy this up and we'll reset with another cupping. Uh, so let's take five. How's that sound? Hi. Welcome back. First of all, any questions from anything we've kind of talked about so far? Can you read again the definition? Yeah. This is just the working definition that we kind of go off of. Um, the degradation of green coffee resulting in specific off flavors that get stronger over time. Another way of kind of looking at it is the loss of unique characteristics from different coffees. This idea that different coffees end up kind of tasting the same and that these same flavors that are off flavors that we don't like get stronger and stronger and stronger, whether it is, you know, that kind of musty banana peel kind of thing maybe, or this like cardboardy kind of thing, or this wet wood kind of thing we were talking about. It seemed like we were pretty calibrated on what these things tasted like. Cool. Um, let's talk a little bit about what actually might cause this fade. Like what are some of these variables that can affect the way a coffee fades and some ways that we can kind of uh, prolong the coffee and make it uh, set up for success to have a good long shelf life. So we're going to start at origin, right? And Katie Cargiulo, who is our West Coast coffee manager, um, and also one of our green buyers in 2012 United States Barista Champion. She's someone that helped us out a lot with this. Woot woot, right? Shout out to Katie. Shout out to Kyle and shout out to Katie. Um, she says that moisture content is one of the biggest factors, if not the biggest factor, that will affect how green coffee fades, right? And so with things that we can kind of measure or control at origin, we'll definitely be talking about moisture content and also to a somewhat other extent uh, water activity. We're talking about how the coffee dries, how we actually achieve that moisture content. We'll be talking about um, kind of the places where coffee is drying and how things like elevation can affect that a little bit. And then how the coffee is stored and how the coffee is shipped as well are things that we'll kind of go into here. So with moisture content, when you have a coffee seed that's entirely ready to start drying, start, uh, it's been cleaned and everything, it's usually at around 60% moisture. And for coffee to be considered specialty grade, we need to get down to 12% or less, right? So 12% is kind of the minimum. Generally, we'll always shoot for between 9 and 11% when we contract coffee with different coffee growers. And so this kind of gets us something a little bit less, and that's what we're shooting for, right? So that's a fair amount of distance a coffee has to go, right? But it's not just the overall moisture content, 9%, 10%, 11%. It's also how we kind of achieve that, right? And you can think if you have a coffee that gets to 9% moisture over the span of three days, it's probably going to fade and age and change a fair amount differently than that same coffee that reaches 9% moisture over like 15 days or 20 days or like two to three weeks. So kind of like the slower and more carefully a coffee dries to its final moisture content, the more shelf stable we've seen it, the more that it kind of has this longevity to it and the less that it'll show fade. So that's a big part of it, right? And what we have here in the upper left-hand corner is a version of a moisture meter, um, something that can kind of uh, read the internal moisture content of a coffee seed. This is something that we've been able to kind of distribute to some of our producer partners occasionally to help with this process. And we can also build this into our contracts and have like a monetary incentive. Hey, if you can hit 9% moisture, we will put an extra 10 cents or so on per pound of coffee because it takes more work. It takes more energy. You have to pay attention to this. And the coffee has to spend more time drying so which means that there's kind of less room for other coffees to go through there. So that's a really important kind of way to do that. And the way that we hit that 9% moisture is pretty important as well. We always want to make sure like seed temperatures are kept pretty low. We don't want temperatures to get above like 120 degrees. So things like raised beds are really helpful because you get airflow over the top and the bottom or having like netting put over the top of the coffee so it's not like exposed to like the midday sun and heating up a lot. 
Once the coffee seed gets down to like 15% moisture, it's almost there, the temperature can rise a little bit, but it's one of these things where generally speaking, you don't want the coffee to get really, really, really hot while it's going through this process as well. So nice, even kind of slow drying is generally a better thing for us, right? Now, contrary to potentially popular opinion, mechanical dryers have actually shown to do this job pretty effectively, right? And I know I just said that you want this to take a long time, and I know I just said that we don't want the temperature to raise very high, but the reason that mechanical dryers, like what we'll see in the bottom right hand corner here, can work well is because you get to control how you apply that heat. The situations where we've seen them work are situations where we have intermittent drying and then periods of resting for the coffee seeds to cool off so they don't get above 120 and also to make sure that we can kind of have like, you know, relatively quickly drying but with periods of on and off, right? So Spotlight, Sippy Falls, Uganda. In 2017, we purchased a coffee from the Chema washing station near Sippy Falls, Uganda. Uh, we purchased it spot or just kind of like off the shelf from Royal Coffee Importers. We needed a coffee to kind of fill a gap. And so we purchased this coffee and it was a really tasty coffee. It came in, we measured it. It was at around 11.3% moisture. And so something where there was a little more than what we wanted. And the coffee started to show signs of fade a little sooner than we probably would have wanted. It was a really tasty coffee, really popular. So we contracted directly with that washing station the next year and we built into our contract that we want a coffee to be at a lower moisture overall, overall moisture content between like nine and 11%. And we got a coffee that was a lot closer to 9% and it lasted forever. It was great, it was delicious, we loved it. And they used mechanical dryers for that. And so it was one of these coffees where based on how they used the mechanical dryer, had actually made it a pretty uh, stable coffee and had some delicious flavors for a long time, which is really nice. Once the coffee gets to its moisture content that you want, its final moisture content, it's still in parchment or that little kind of shell on it, but it needs to be protected still because that parchment kind of only helps so much. And this is one of these situations where if you were to dry a coffee, say at elevation, right, really high, it's usually not very humid up there, right? But then you were to like mill the coffee or take the coffee down to a lower elevation when it's still exposed to the environment, that coffee could very easily reabsorb moisture. So it's kind of crucial that, especially after you take off that parchment, that shell, that you're gonna have the coffee protected from reabsorbing moisture back from the environment, right? So what we usually suggest is what we'll call, uh, not what we'll call, what is called like Grain Pro, which is a certain kind of bag that coffee gets stored in. We'll pass around some samples, we'll talk more about that later. But like vacuum sealed bags or Grain Pro bags are really helpful for coffee at every step along the process. We don't mandate that coffee that's still in parchment gets you know, stored in Grain Pro as well. We totally suggest it. But this is a situation where every coffee that gets shipped either needs to be shipped in Grain Pro or in a vacuum sealed bag because shipping can take months and we need to make sure that that coffee is secure as it's being shipped across the ocean or across uh, national uh, borders and such as well. So that part's pretty important because UV light can really destroy coffee, right? It can uh, kind of like wreak havoc on it and like sunlight does that and like temperature fluctuations and humidity fluctuations and coffee getting stuck at port and things and customs, right? All these things can just really mess with the way a coffee tastes and we wanna set coffees up for success despite the fact that we know they have a long journey to go from where they get picked and initially dried to 9% to when we actually roast the coffee, right? Thoughts, questions, comments on things. Oh, moisture activity. Moisture activity is an interesting thing that we are learning more about as an industry ourselves. Moisture content has to do with the overall like moisture inside something. Water activity has to do with its readiness or likelihood of giving off or receiving more or less moisture. So you can think about if you have something that can have whatever kind of moisture content, if it has a really low water activity, it's kind of bound up and trapped. It's not gonna receive any more in a humid environment and it's not gonna give any off in like a really dry or arid environment. So moisture content is something where we have meters that can measure that as well. That's something that we as counterculture and I think as an industry are pushing forward more on a lot. I've seen a couple um, really awesome coffee people recently have like Instagram posts about things like water activity and that being something that we should keep looking at. So it's definitely kind of like the next steps of research as well on how to prolong the life of our green coffee. It's also worth noting that when we're talking about origin and variables here, you know, um, Kat, what's up? Yeah, I don't have a straight definition on it. Um, what, yeah, water, act, I know, right? It's kind of an interesting concept. So total moisture, like mo moisture content has to do with how much moisture is actually inside of something. Water activity has to do with kind of how it's going to give off 
or take moisture. So it's whether or not it's actually gonna move or change, how readily it's gonna change. You can have something with a relatively high moisture content, but if it has low water activity, it's not going to dry out in, an, in a dry or arid environment, and it's not gonna absorb moisture in a more humid kind of environment. So, yeah, interesting thing, right? Is that prophesizing that that has everything to do with like, its actual biological breakdown? You know, or? that's an interesting thing. And so this idea of biology, like I'm not exactly sure how that overlaps with this. You know, one thing that we've noticed, observed, is that different varieties don't necessarily show fade differently. It's kind of across all varieties. Different processing methods don't really show fade differently. You know, com coffees from different countries or from different origins don't inherently show fade differently. Although you can think if a coffee gets, you know, picked and dried and uh, dry mill, the parchment gets taken off, you know, in a high like elevation somewhere in like Ethiopia or Peru, like it's probably not gonna absorb any more moisture and it's gonna be really stable. But if it kind of is in one of these countries where it gets taken down to a lower elevation before it's packaged, like potentially you could have a problem, but that's with how you treat it, not necessarily kind of like anything indicative to the way that coffee grows in that country. So I can't specifically speak to that. And I think that there's, on, in terms in, of like water activity especially, but I don't know of a lot of like biological correlations between the plant and how it shows fate. Is that kind of your question? Yeah. Did that answer your question? Okay. Cool. That's a good question, though. Honestly, it is. And I think that's kind of the idea that, like, there's a lot of this that, like, we're talking about our experiences here, which is different than, like, this is exactly what's going on, and this is what we know. So, yeah, that's fair. What else? Good questions. I don't know if it has anything to do with this, but, like, the actual, like, chemical upcasting. Hmm. Yeah, Water activity is something that has a lot of like different kind of factors associated with it. I wouldn't necessarily think that the that caffeine, everything kind of has an element of water activity, um, not just like coffee seeds. Um, I'm trying to think of an example of something that like can be like can have like a high moisture content but doesn't necessarily readily give it off, and I can't off the top of my head. Um, but I don't, I can't specifically speak to whether there's a correlation between those two things. Water activity is honestly something we're like, we think this is pretty important. We think this is pretty clutch. We don't have a ton of information about it though. So it's like, I'm gonna put it out there and be like, I would almost hope that these would be questions that like we can like move forward like as an industry and kind of get better answers for that kind of idea. I'm really happy. I kind of always hope that whenever we have a pro dev, we leave with open-ended questions where I'm like, I don't know the answer to that, but this is something we should keep researching, isn't it? That kind of thing. So I think water activity probably falls into that category. Yeah. What else? Cool. So, your coffee travels across the ocean or travels across land borders. It's in trucks, it's in ships. Hopefully it's in a grain pro bag or hopefully it is in a, uh, um, a vacuum sealed bag. Once the coffee arrives at the roastery or arrives in the country where it's gonna be roasting, it's not entirely stable, it continues to change. And so things like environmental stability and control over where the green coffee sits is really important. Um, we have um, several climate controlled warehouses that we use in different parts of the country that are not where the roasteries are. And a large amount of our coffee stays there before we have small amounts of coffee come to the roastery. And this is because of the fact that change can still happen at the roastery, right? So Kyle Tisch, who is one of our quality analysis in Durham, North Carolina, um, did a test where he was gonna be sample roasting some coffee in the morning. And so he pulled the coffee out in the afternoon in Durham, North Carolina measured the moisture content of it, it was totally fine. The next morning before roasting it, measured it again, moisture content had gone up. Durham, North Carolina is not necessarily known for being an arid place, and so those uh, warm, southern, humid nights definitely seem to affect the way that uh, the coffee had, um, what its overall moisture content was. So this is definitely something that's kind of pretty important. So. I'm gonna go ahead and say that I think inventory control is one of the largest ways that a coffee roaster can really be in charge of you know, green coffee fade. Recognizing this is something that all coffees will ultimately go through, um, some coffees sooner than others. So there's factors that you can kind of monitor with that, but inventory control is huge. We taste a lot of really good coffees, a lot of really stellar things that if we don't think we'll be able to move it off our menu in time, like there's not a good reason to buy it. 
And so this is one of these things where I think that we have a little bit of an advantage because of the fact that we buy green coffee. Like we source things directly, and so we can get coffees that are set up for success this way. If you're purchasing coffee off somebody else's shelf, do you really know the story of that coffee? Do you really know much about it in terms of how long it's gonna last on your menu? So I think that's something that's kind of worth considering. The inventory control is huge. You know, and this idea of like quality analysis while you're going through this entire process is pretty important as well, right? So the way that we control coffee at uh, the roasteries is generally things are left in um, ambient temperature, so kind of like room temperature. Um, what we have are a couple different kinds of bags. So we're all familiar with burlap or jute bags, right? Everyone's seen these? Like you see them on the wall of your favorite coffee shop and it's really romantic and it says like Guatemala on there and you're like, oh, that's, that's what my coffee comes in. Coffee always comes in a burlap bag, right? That kind of idea. Now, burlap bags are not necessarily the best for transporting coffee. They've got big holes in them. They allow a lot of moisture through and other things, right? And they don't really smell that good either. And coffee can definitely pick up smells and flavors while it is in transit, right? So I'm gonna pass this around, and this is one thing where, go ahead and give it a sniff, and if your coffee smelled like that, I feel like you'd probably, you know, not want to come back the next day for another latte, that kind of situation. But they're great, they're wonderful, you know? We definitely still use them as well. But Grain Pro is kind of an industry standard as well. When you think about Grain Pro, you can think about like a Ziploc bag, essentially. And Grain Pro can either get sealed at origin, or like when the coffee is dry milled, has that parchment taken off of it. If it's not like actually sealed, it can be zip tied as well. And that still does a really, really, really good job. So we always want to have our coffee in something that seals it and Grain Pro is a good example of that. When coffee is shipped in Grain Pro, it'll be in Grain Pro inside a jute or burlap bag still. And this is because those jute or burlap bags are really good for marking contents on there and for like um, different certifications, letting you know what's on it in a really easy kind of way. They're good for stacking, they look great, right? But they're necessarily good straight by themselves for just storing the coffee. We also have vacuum sealing. And so this is kind of two different examples of different materials that we used in vacuum sealing. And you can see the indentations from the green coffee seeds in there. If you smell them, it smells like green coffee, which is an interesting kind of smell, especially if you're not super familiar with it. Um, it really reminds you that coffee is a plant, <laughs> that green smell of green coffee, right? And so vacuum sealing is great. Oftentimes it can be something that's done at origin as well. And it's kind of best case scenario um, vacuum sealed coffees will generally get shipped in cardboard boxes and then grain pro bags of coffee will get shipped in jute or burlap. So it's a little bit different that way. Um, and so we can see Brett Donahue here, which is one of our long, long, long term roasters at Counterculture over in Durham. So we've got some awesome coffee right here that is also inside of uh, uh, grain pro inside of a uh, jute or burlap bag. So that's pretty excellent. And we've got coffee being stored over there in our Emeryville uh, warehouse, so hey, we might be drinking some of that coffee right now, that kind of idea. So storage is really huge. Um, it's really important. We've thought about things like freezing coffee, and to a small extent, this is something that we kind of already do. Um, we have a few coffees that we use for educational purposes, and we'll keep the green coffee in a freezer. Uh, Kibewa, if you recall, had like the triple process kind of set, and so we've got green coffee from the Kibewa three different ways that's still in the freezer. We'll pull some out, we'll roast it, but it's for classes. It's for things like cupping fundamentals or like coffee origins kind of lab. So it's one of these things where a 150 pound bag of coffee is a, needs a fair amount of like freezer space. Like it couldn't just be like a regular chest freezer. It'd have to be like refrigerate, like a freezer room. And like the energy that would be required for that and the cost that would be required for that probably would not be offset by having coffee that is like slightly less faded. I think inventory control is a better way of kind of, of approaching that rather than like prolonging its life by sticking it in the freezer. And you can think with like roasted coffee when people are like, hey, is the best way to store this coffee in the freezer? Not really, unless you wanna break all the rules, in which case that's okay. But freezing your coffee is not necessarily an ideal situation. It doesn't stay forever. Cool, thoughts, questions, comments, concerns? Yeah, I think you need to go through your coffee quickly. You know, you could use an Amazon Sphere, I guess. Um, but it's a really humid place in there, right? It's definitely more than 9% moisture. So, you know, it'd be a fun place to be, but I don't think it would um, necessarily work super well for actually like storing the green coffee. Um, yeah, inventory control, I think, is like the biggest way of doing this. It's a tricky job. All the logistics of coffees coming in and going out, and what do you use these coffees for? Or, yeah, it's a big part of the game. One of our favorite partners, Marisa Belcaballero, who owns Finca El Puente, 
which is the coffee that we're going to be tasting over here. Did a tour of the states called the um, uh, Works in Progress Tour. And one of the things that she said is that along every single stage of the process, you can either maintain the quality of a coffee or you can lose that quality. You can't really ever make it better than what someone else has kind of done before you. And I think that's this kind of idea. We go through a lot of work to make sure that we are maintaining the high quality of uh, the people who grow the coffee and the people who pick the coffee and the people who process the coffee and then dry the coffee. And you can only really lose that quality throughout the process if you don't treat the coffee appropriately. I'll actually take that one step further. You baristas, right? You were the, the what they say, the 30th person. 30 different people will touch a coffee along its entire life to the person who drinks it. And all of that responsibility at one day kind of shows up in your door in this box. And it's your job to kind of do that last part with it and brew it. So I'm super happy to have a bunch of amazing baristas here in this room that I've worked with for a long time. But that is kind of that level of uh, this is the responsibility that comes with this. So something to definitely think about. Cool. All right, so um, let's taste some coffees. So this is a coffee that we had before. This was the uh, most, uh, that was, yeah. Okay. Pinky again. Five. Okay. No problem. Uh, a barometer to give us an idea of where these others are. Mm. Brain's trying to figure this out. Right there, right? I don't know, it's hard to really like define the tasting of difference, but like for whatever reason the normal really had like a stronger flavor for yes. me. Yes. But they were very similar. Sure. Yeah, like I found this I wrote peanut brittle for this one, and this mm -hmm. one was like a darker caramel. Normal for this one means this coffee sat in vacuum sealed bags in ambient temperature in our warehouse. So this is how we would normally be storing coffee that we are not about to roast. So this was that same coffee in a freezer. Did it help preserve it? It's kind of fresh And then we took it out of the vacuum so this one and just exposed it to the uh, elements. And then this is fresh crop, which was vacuum sealed in Honduras. So this is as good as it's gonna get for that one. <laughs> so normal or vacuum sealed the warehouse. This one's actually a six. And then vacuum sealed the freezer, this was given a three, so not that high, not yeah. that high. So if you want to, we can still go back and kind of taste this one. And then fresh crop, yep, big old zero. There should be zero signs of fate in that, that's what we're looking for, right? Think about gravia, I think, you know, we kind of look at these numbers and it looks like we're a little lower across the board with these, which I think is appropriate. We already knew the faded one was about a five, and that's as bad as it gets. In the freezer, this one had a one, so just a little bit, the very beginnings of the sign of fade. And then stored in room temperature, we have three. And again, um, fresh crop, zero. Cool. So this last part is kind of an, an interesting thing to discuss. What do you do when the worst happens? What do you do when your coffee starts to show signs of fade? Right? Well, you, you have a good cry and then you kind of move on with your life, right? <laughs> and I feel like it's, it's worth noting, number one, that inventory control is still the biggest thing that you can do. Like, stop the problem before it happens, right? Don't buy too much coffee. Make sure that you kind of check your coffee regularly. Quality analysis is a huge part of this as well. Have systems in place. As soon as you start tasting a one in something, like, know what you're gonna do with that coffee. Like, recognize that, hey, based on what we've seen from this coffee before, most likely we should start getting a game plan for what happens if and when we start getting signs of fade. I think that part's really important to kind of think about, right? So this quality analysis, we're gonna cut this part out as well. I think this is a similar kind of thing to like at coffee shops when you have co retail coffee or coffee that's getting close to like that two week mark or that mark where you wanna kind of like pull it off the shelves. You know, you make batch brew out of it. You make cold brew out of it. You put it in the hopper for a day and you use it more quickly. If we have a coffee that we think is gonna start showing signs of fade or is starting to show small amounts of fade, we can move that coffee through a lot quicker, right? It's also important to kind of recognize that a lot of things that we're talking about are kind of like aromatic things or more delicate kind of flavors. And depending on how you can kind of roast a coffee, those are things that you can play up or kind of play down. So one thing you can do with the coffee that's starting to show some interesting things about fade is kind of just tweak it a little bit, tweak the development and kind of tweak the roast a little bit. Pushing the coffee further along the spectrum of how you roast it has a tendency to kind of make different flavors come out of it. Um, where have you at of our, at our pro dev on roasting last quarter? So in that one, we talked about, you know, when you roast coffee, you take sugars in the coffee, you create acids, and then those break down naturally and kind of create other flavors and you keep on going around the flavor wheel. 
the further you roast a coffee, right? So the more that you kind of develop it, the further you roast it, the more you kind of downplay some of those like subtle elements or some of those like floral, delicate air, like aromas and things, and kind of replace them with larger flavors or bolder flavors, right? So I think that's an interesting thing that you can do with coffee, and that's definitely one way you can start working with coffee that has some signs of fade. We had a coffee on the menu last year called Shifra Jigso on the East Coast menu, and it was a single origin uh, washed Ethiopian coffee, so super floral, delicate, light, that kind of thing. Started showing signs of fade sooner than we wanted it to, but by kind of tweaking the roast a little bit, like we still have all these amazing coffee flavors that still came out when we had the coffee as like Apollo or Big Trouble. Mm -hmm. And so roasting it slightly different meant that we still got to preserve those things that were inherently there, but kind of have them be a little bit downplayed based on how we roast the coffee or developed it. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing that can definitely happen to it as well. Cupping is also something where like, it's a really good way to compare coffee side by side. And it's a really good way to kind of look at specific elements in coffee, especially like delicate aromas or aftertaste and things. And there's definitely other ways of brewing coffee that are better for actually drinking it, right? So brew methods that are kind of like bigger or heavier or more intense can also be things that'll downplay some of these flavors, right? So things like espresso that focus on like body, and espresso that focuses on flavor, right? And intense flavors and stuff. French press as well is gonna kind of tone down some of these things, so you won't get those flavors quite as much, right? So roasting things slightly differently is one way to deal with these coffees or uh, slightly different ways of kind of brewing them can be a helpful thing as well. I think it's important to recognize that every coffee has a home and every coffee has a market. Like there is no coffee that's like so bad that it can't be consumed. I remember going to um, El Salvador to Finca, oh, not Finca Puente, um, Finca Mauritania, uh, um, which is Aida Batye's farm. And so we've had some of her coffees kind of come through. And so watching the coffee get sorted, it was kind of a binary system, it would go through the sorting table and the coffees that were like better would go one direction, the coffees that were worse would go another direction. And the coffee that went through this table three times and got to know every single time the worst of the worst coffee was safe for local consumption, which isn't necessarily like good coffee, right? But every coffee has a home. It would still go someplace. And so I think it's worth recognizing that coffee that has signs of fade, like isn't just trash. Like it still has ways it can be used. It still has kind of a market for it. And so one of the things that we can do with this coffee is a program we have that's like bulk coffee. So it's like private label or kind of like off-brand coffee. And the reason that we originally started having another home for coffees like this is because we received a coffee where the pre-shipment of it was really tasty, but then the actual lot wasn't. Mm -hmm. And so we're kind of stuck in this position where we reserve the right to like reject an order that comes in differently than what we've expected. But at the same time, we don't always want to play that card. It can be one of these things where like we don't necessarily want to be like, nope, we're going to send this back to you. This isn't really what we're going to do. And so we accepted the coffee and received it anyway, but it wasn't something that we were going to put on our menu, right? A coffee with like a fade score of like five or so, it's like it's not really gonna be on our menu. We're not gonna put our name on that. So bulk coffee is something we could do with that. Put it on a different kind of label. We don't make money on that. Like it's like razor thin margins, if anything. So this is not good business practice to have a lot of coffee go out the door as bulk. And this is one way we actually measure our success as an inventory and roasting team is whether or not we have a lot or a little coffee that goes out the door as bulk. A lot of the reason that we even look at things like moisture content was to figure out how to reduce the amount of coffee that was bulk. And so by having specific moisture contents, we've had better success with having better coffees last longer. Because these are stellar coffees, right? These are amazing things that really like we want to showcase. And so putting them out the door under a different name is always kind of worst case scenario with that. So it's an interesting kind of topic to think about like how does a coffee company that buys its own coffee and kind of contracts its own coffee and shipment and then roasts its own coffee. How does that operate differently than a company that buys coffee kind of off the shelf from an importer? How's a green coffee importer who doesn't even roast coffee deal with this, right? Because all they have is a shelf like that. And kind of this idea of like, how much are we really focusing on it? I think is an interesting thing too. So I may have to turn the computer on. Nope. Basically, I think that's kind of an interesting topic and it's kind of, you know, we're a company that pretty aggressively looks at fade and has like a really kind of like strong stance on it. And so we pay a lot of attention to it. I think we're pretty calibrated in terms of, you know, our green coffee buyers and our quality analysis. So in sum, I'd kind of like to leave you with this quote from Katie Cargiulo, who's our West Coast coffee manager again. And she says, fade is a problem because it's the same fade flavor for every coffee. It takes away the unique characteristics of each coffee and replaces it and makes them all the same. It takes away the specialty of our specialty coffee which I think is a really poignant way to kind of put it. These are all very special coffees with unique flavors. And we don't want the coffee from Guatemala tasting like the coffee from Ethiopia, tasting like the coffee from Kenya. 
So yeah, green coffee fade. We've got a lot more to learn about as an industry. I hope you learned a couple things in terms of what this coffee might taste like. Um, and you kind of keep your eye out for it and we can keep learning about it as well. Thoughts, questions, comments? Cool. Time. <laughs> Oh, don't do that.